morning, North Langley Community Church. It's so good to be with you here at the Walnut Grove campus this morning. My name's Janet, and if we have not met, I'm one of the pastors here on staff, and it's great to look out and see your faces this morning. I also want to just add my welcome, and if you are new, maybe on this long weekend, you are visiting here with family or friends, maybe this experience of being in church on a Sunday morning is new to you, or maybe you're exploring faith or Jesus. Welcome. We're so, so glad you're here, and hope that we can connect further as the weeks go on, but thank you for being here. You have landed on week four of our Godspeed series, Godspeed, the pace of apprenticeship. And um, just to unpack that a wee bit here, right off, this, right off the top, Godspeed, that's, you know, maybe you think, well, that's a kind of an old English welcome, like, you know, be well, <laughs> good travels, whatever, Godspeed. We're actually taking it to mean literally God's speed. How do we walk with God at his speed as apprentices, apprentices of Jesus? You know, if we want to be shaped by Jesus, if we want our desires to line up with God's, if we want our character to reflect that of Jesus, to be his apprentice, how do we learn to walk with him at his pace? Like not running 10 steps ahead, not distracted, not uh, inattentive, not complacent, but walking at the speed of God, God's speed. So we've had a few topics along the way. Last week, we talked about the pace of Sabbath. And yeah, big thanks to Pastor John, who brought that message. It was so good, that just that reminder that Sabbath is a gift to us. It's a gift in our lives to realign us with God's speed. This week, the title is The Pace of Love. So what does it mean to walk at the pace of love? Well, if I'm honest, this whole series has been a little bit of a tension for me. You know, um, I hear, we hear about, okay, slowing down to catch up with Jesus, walking at God's speed. Um, what does that mean? Well, um, the little cynical side of me, I don't really have a cynical side, but <laughs> the little cynical side of me might say, okay, Jesus, like, were you just this chill dude that lived out three years of ministry in low gear? You know, we can kind of, don't we kind of sometimes we can be a little cynical, like was Jesus kind of like a, 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 a hippie who, you know, never rushed through anything? You know, not that maybe hippies do rush, I don't know. But Jesus walked, and that's the point of this. Like, how do we walk at his speed? So cynicism aside, yes, Jesus walked. He also rode a donkey at least once that we know of, and he went in a boat a few times as well. But I wonder, if, like, if he lived now, would he have driven a car or hopped a bus or <laughs> flown in an airplane? Well, I don't know, because 2,000 years ago, they walked. And walking wasn't easy. Walking was hard work 2,000 years ago. A couple years ago, I had the opportunity to go to Israel, and we covered some distance there. You know, we went from Nazareth to uh, Galilee to Jerusalem or, you know, I don't know, Jericho to the Jordan but we went in a bus. And what was eye-opening to me was the distances. Like, they're not short distances that Jesus walked. And the terrain, it's not flat, like, you know, the map in the back of your Bible. These are not easy distances or ways to travel. Jesus walked. Walking was not easy. It wasn't a stroll. It wasn't a walk in the park. And the pace of love is not easy either, where we're called to walk like Jesus. Well, what does that mean? Well, right from the beginning of creation, uh, we hear this term that God walked with people. God walked with Adam and Eve in the garden, didn't he? He, he walked, and, and of course, maybe literal walking, yes, but walking is a way to say he spent time with, he um, uh, spent time loving, sharing, talking, abiding with. That's what it meant when God walked with people in the garden. It was communion. It was formation. Right from the get-go, God said this, I will walk among you and be your God, and you will be my people. I will walk among you and be your God. So it's always been God's desire to love us, to walk with us. Like even when people sinned, God didn't turn his back on them. 
but he walked with them. He walked with them right out of the garden and into the whole story of humanity. He walked with them through history to a point in time where he actually took on human flesh and walked here on earth so that we could see the demonstration of God's love for us. He walked in our shoes here on earth. Now, I'm old enough, plenty old enough, to remember the first moonwalk. Anybody here remember the first moonwalk? A few hands out there. Well, I was seven years old, and I totally remember being glued to the TV screen when like, Neil Armstrong took the first steps out of Apollo 11 and walked on the surface of the moon. This was astounding. This was earth-shattering to see someone walk on the moon. But even more astounding was that Jesus crossed time and eternity and space and divinity to walk with us. And he walked with purpose, and he walked with a mission, and his mission took him, because of love, to the cross. So if we're going to walk with Jesus, we're going to go in his direction. He sets the agenda. He sets the pace. And he may choose a pathway or a speed that we're not comfortable with or makes us annoyed, but it's the pace of love. And what does that look like? Well, let me ask you this. Was Jesus a busy person? How would you answer that? We're going to look at one slice of one possibly very typical day in the life of Jesus to get an idea of what the pace of love looked like. And it's found in Luke 8. Luke 8, and we're going to read from uh, verse 40 to verse um, 55. So if you have your Bibles, you can open that up, but it's also on the screen. Let's read together. Now, when Jesus returned, a crowd welcomed him, for they were all expecting him. Hey, we're going to stop right there. (laughs) When Jesus returned, returned from where? Well, he came from across the lake in a boat, and he had just been at the other side of the lake healing a man who was uh, full of demons. And he healed this man, he set him free, set him into his right mind, and he returns back to the shores of Galilee. And there's a crowd there, because at this point in Jesus' ministry, crowds were following him, and they were expecting him. Crowds had expectations of Jesus. Okay, let's pick up in verse 41. Just then a man named Jairus, a ruler of the synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come to his house because his only daughter, a girl of about 12, was dying. As Jesus was on his way, the crowds almost crushed him. And a woman who was there, and a woman was there who had been subject to bleeding for 12 years, but no one could heal her. She came up behind him and touched the edge of his cloak, and immediately her bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked. When they all denied it, Peter said, Master, the people are crowding and pressing against you. But Jesus said, Someone touched me. I know that the power has gone out from me. Then the woman, seeing that she could not go unnoticed, came trembling and fell at his feet. In the presence of all the people, she told why she had touched him and how she had been instantly healed. Then he said to her, daughter, your faith has healed you. Go in peace. While Jesus was still speaking, some, some, oh, sorry. Someone came from the house of Jairus, the synagogue ruler. Your daughter is dead, he said. Don't bother the teacher anymore. Hearing this, Jesus said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just believe. She will be healed. When he arrived at the house of Jairus, he did not let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, and James, and the child's father and mother. Meanwhile, All the people were wailing and mourning for her. Stop wailing, Jesus said. She's not dead, but asleep. They laughed at him, knowing that she was dead. But he took her by the hand and said, My child, get up. Her spirit returned, and at once she stood up. Then Jesus told them to give her something to eat. This is the word of the Lord. Okay, the pace of love. Well, we could actually entitle today's message, the pace of interruptions. In fact, Jesus had his interruptions interrupted, didn't he? And I I know parents of young kids get this. You're doing one thing, you're interrupted, and then something else interrupts the interruption. School teachers get this. Anybody who works with the public and, you know, service industry, food industry, you get this. Interruptions mean what? You're responding to people's needs. 
And Jesus did this time and time again. Marcia Leber notes this about how Jesus used his time. If you had slept in the same house or field with Jesus, awakened with him, eaten with him, helped him, what would you have observed? One thing we always think of is that Jesus gave himself almost entirely to what we would consider interruptions. Most of the teaching, healing, wonders we see in his life were responsive, seemingly unplanned. He trusted that what the Father allowed to cross his path was exactly that, from the Father. Jesus always seemed willing for things to get messy. Jesus' first interruption, a distraught dad whose daughter's dying. And Jesus welcomes this interruption. He follows. The crowds do too. They're pressing around him. And suddenly he's interrupted again, this time by a woman who was suffering, who touches him. And he turns and he sees and he listens and he responds. And after that healing, Jesus is interrupted again. And this time by the servant who says, the girl's dead. Don't bother to come at all. But Jesus has a purpose and he's not deterred. And he lovingly raises this girl from the dead and restores her to her parents. Jesus was interrupted at least three times in this passage alone. And if you look at the Gospels as a whole, 50% or more of Jesus' interaction in his ministry were so-called interruptions. Kosuke Kuyama, in his book, Life on the Vine, coins a new word, and, um, well, new to me anyway. He says this, interruptibility. Interruptibility is a sign that we're moving at the speed of love. Interruptibility. The capacity to be interruptible. Would you consider yourself an interruptible person? Why don't you ask the person next to you? <laughs> Am I an interruptible person? Well, there's three things that we can or should learn from the life of Jesus and even from this story in particular. And the first one is kind of obvious, but you know, um, we, have to, we have to look deeply at this one because interruptions expose. What do I mean by that? Well, they they, they peel back, you know, you kind of get to peel behind the curtain and see what's actually going on inside, just under the surface. Interruptions also can, some, should be avoided. They're not all created equal. Number three, interruptions can happen on purpose. So let's look at these together. First, interruptions expose. They reveal what's true. Why? Because by their nature, they're not planned. They happen spontaneously. We can't prepare for them, and they often reveal my heart. One, I don't know if I've shared this before, but one incessantly trying day, I was being constantly interrupted by the needs of one of my kids, and I was at my wit's end. So I gave myself a timeout. I locked my bed, went in and locked my bedroom door. But a little while later, uh, I hear this noise, and under the door, you know, comes eight little fingers with words on them. And they say, Mom, please come out now. I need you. <laughs> and I was like, okay. But why do interruptions elicit such, like, exaggerated response from us? Well, interruptions, at their very minimum, disturb the pace of life. We have our days planned, our to-dos mapped out, and there's no margin in our schedule. And interruptions, well, they just inevitably happen. The car breaks down. A kid gets sick. A friend is calling and, and needs a listening ear. The printer doesn't work. There's a traffic jam, or our neighbor wants to chat, or a teenager forgets their homework or their lunch, or there's a doorbell rings when it's dinner time, or the appointment runs late, or the checkout line is stalled, like, you name it. You know, I have to admit that, and my family could actually verify this, <laughs> some of my most unchristlike moments have happened because I've not responded well when an unexpected interruption like misplaced keys on the small scale, to a child's tantrum, or too many demands on my time, or whatever, big or small, derail my plans. So how should we see interruptions in our days? Are they distractions and disruptions? Or are they, can they be divine God moments? 
If we aren't continually learning to walk at the pace of love, the pace of Jesus, with eyes that see interruptions as things that God is allowing, we can end up irritated, annoyed, angry, and we can really resent people for interrupting us. Because people or events, interruptions stop my forward motion. They break in. They stop me from achieving my goals. They limit my productivity. They waste my time. And we arrogantly think, I shouldn't have to put up with this. So we can develop this kind of self-importance about our time, that it's a possession that I control or I divvy up as I see best. And so that ends up being a sort of power, right? Like, um, I'll be gracious to someone that I consider worthy of it, but on the other hand, I'll avoid someone who might waste my time. But what does this passage teach us about the pace of love and time and importance? See, Jesus was interrupted initially by someone who was very important, important in that community, at the center of community life, a synagogue leader. He would have been well-known and well-respected. He had a cherished, loved daughter of 12 years. The people understood why Jesus went to his house and went to intervene. Then suddenly, Jesus is interrupted. And this time, he's interrupted by someone who's on the margins of society, someone who is sick, an outcast, destitute, 12 years, but 12 years of suffering. And Jesus stops, and he sees her, and he's present, and he lovingly calls her daughter, and he restores her to the family, to the community. Now, do you think Jairus or the crowds questioned this delay, this interruption? Maybe they thought, you know, Jesus, you just need better time management. This isn't working. You need better boundaries. Because it seems as though the time it took to care for this suffering woman, woman had dire consequences on his more important mission. Jairus had a goal, and then something, actually someone, got in the way of that. And we get this, don't we? We have important things that we need to get to. Our course of action is set. And then one thing after another interrupts, and how do we respond? Well, if you look at the Gospels, you get the sense in story after story that Jesus was constantly responding to needs, but he was not in a hurry. He listens, he responds, he cares, he is present in the moment with each and every person, even when he's interrupted. Henri Nouwen is a spiritual thinker and writer, and he said this, you know, my whole life I've been complaining that my work was constantly interrupted until I discovered that my interruptions were my work. Remember that term, interruptibility. It's a sign that we're moving at the speed of love. Like, I don't want to be so scheduled, so planned, so productive, that I don't have time for divine interruptions that God wants to bring into my life. See, we can be in danger, actually, of overlooking the little moments, too, right? The small times that, you know, God wants to have a God moment with someone, because we're so intent, we're so task-oriented, we're so head down, <laughs> and we miss it. It's kind of like, um, I was thinking, you know, because I grew up in Pennsylvania, and the Amish have horse and buggies that are um, driving on the roads, but they always put blinders on their horses, right, on the eyes. You ever see that? And the point of blinders on a horse is so that the horse can just see right down its nose and straight ahead and isn't distracted by anything that happens around it. And I, I thought, you know, God, I need you to remove my blinders. I don't want to have blinders on so that I'm not aware of what's going, around, going on around me because I'm so intent on getting to my destination. See, what if interruptions may be the point of the day? Maybe they are the most important thing. Maybe they are the priority. Happiness and fulfillment, and study after study shows this, actually come when we give ourselves away, when we fight against culture's strong bent towards my time and me time. Joy isn't found in turning inwards. 
that will eventually lead to loneliness or isolation or boredom or actually even loss of purpose. The pace of love that Jesus invites us into is one of lifting our eyes off of, our, off of ourselves and seeing those around us. And those moments are rarely scheduled. They're rarely planned, but they happen when we're attentive. What do interruptions expose in our hearts? Impatience, avoidance, annoyance, or can we see them as divine moments where God is slowing us down to the pace of love, teaching us to be gracious, teaching us to be compassionate? Which leads me to our second point that we need to consider, that there are some interruptions we need to avoid. They're not all created equal. Some interruptions can and should be quieted. We shouldn't receive every interruption as a holy interruption. And I know what I'm going to say is not new, but let's just hear it again. The distraction of technology has taken interruptions to a whole new level. You know this. I know this. Whether it's our phone or our watch, beeping or buzzing or emails notifying or our calendar reminding or our news app updating or social media summoning, whatever it is, we have grown accustomed to having a mind that's fragmented by technology. And I think sometimes we're just too embarrassed to admit that these kinds of distractions are, are happening to us and that it's hard to turn, it's difficult to turn off our phone for any length of time. I find this difficult. I mean, I think I must have FOMO, <laughs> or maybe I'm one of those pe people who just has to research everything and make sure I know what's going on. And I mean, that's ridiculous, you know? But these interruptions are not helping us to be attentive to those around us. See, we may resent an interruption from a neighbor or a coworker or a child, yet we mindlessly just welcome the constant stream of news or memes or posts from perfect strangers. We must find large chunks of time when we're able to turn off technology. This definitely applies to Sabbath, but we learn to calm the distractions if we're going to be willing and ready to welcome real and meaningful interruptions. But sometimes Jesus, the savior of the world, said no to interruptions. I think one of the struggles that we have, or that I have for sure, is there's so many needs around us, it's so great, and we're limited. We're limited by being human, we're limited sometimes by resources, and often there's this, you know, this is fueled by guilt, the thought that Jesus would help everybody, so so should we. And is it wrong to say no? Is that okay? Remember that the bracelets that we used to wear, they had... Um, uh, four letters on them, WWJD, what it stand for? What would Jesus do? Yeah. Corey used to always say, what would Janet do? <laughs> I think it's equally as important, but no, I'm teasing. But what would Jesus do? Would Jesus ever say no? Well, Jesus was the most compassionate person that ever walked the face of the earth. But he, he, wasn't, a, he wasn't a people pleaser. He had very clear understanding of his mission. He wasn't controlled by other people's expectation, even if they were like large crowds at the edge of a lake. He listened to the voice of his father. If someone asked him to do something that contradicted what his father wanted, he simply opted not to. And there's a number of places in the Gospels where we, where we get this, these scenarios, and they can even feel a little surprising or maybe uncomfortable because, you know, we hate disappointing people. In Matthew 12, we see Jesus' mother and brothers. They're making a request of him. They're outside, and Jesus is inside teaching this, large, you know, in the middle of teaching, and they want him to come out, and they want to talk to him right away. And Jesus doesn't. He continues doing what he's called to do, and that is, in that moment, teaching. You know, saying no often comes at a price. But in reality, it is a gift. Without the ability to communicate, communicate that we won't do something, our lives would become overwhelmed, no margin, pushed to the limit. So there wouldn't be time for any divine interventions. They would be impossible. Now, I'll just stop here and say, I know this all sounds like a contradiction. 
And there's such a tension here. And it needs wisdom and it needs discernment. And some of us find it really hard to say no. And yet again, um, you know, with this tension, and I find in my experience, actually, a lot more of us find it hard to give up our time and to welcome an interruption. But nevertheless, Jesus did not stop everywhere. Jesus did not heal everyone. There was another occasion in Mark 1 where after a very full day of ministry, we find Jesus saying no. Mark 1, um, verse 35. Rising very early before dawn, he, meaning Jesus, left, and he went off to a deserted place where he prayed. Simon and those who were with him pursued him, and on finding him, they said, everyone is looking for you. And he told them, let us go to the nearby villages so that I may preach there also for this purpose I have come. Jesus had limits. He couldn't be everywhere at once. He stays on mission. And often this is the case with us. We, we want to be generous. We want to help others. We want to step in. But we must also feed and raise our children, finish our homework, show up at work, show up at school, meet other real obligations. And saying no is not necessarily unchristlike, but it's a humble admission admission that we have limits. So how do we walk this pace of love? Number three, interruptions on purpose. How do we know what needs to be responded to? Well, as I said before, Jesus spent time with the Father. He did what the Father directed him to do. And that's how Jesus lived his life. See, it's incorrect, actually, to use the word interruptions because technically, like, they weren't interruptions. They were responses to what the Father was prompting Jesus to do. And Jesus taught we, that we should live the same way. But how? How do, we, how, do we, how do we know? How do we respond like that? Does anybody know what day it is on the church calendar today? Yeah, I heard it over here. It's Pentecost. It's Pentecost Sunday. Penta, penta means 50. Today marks the 50th day on the church calendar uh, from when Jesus rose again. And it's the day that the church celebrates because 50 days after Jesus rose from the dead, God sent the most amazing gift of all. And that was himself, his presence, his spirit to fill the believers who were waiting. And everyone who has opened up their heart, their life to Jesus, surrendered to him, is filled with the Holy Spirit. And friends, this is the key. This is the most important thing. We have the Holy Spirit living with us. Let's look together at Galatians 5.25. Since we are living by the Spirit, let us follow the Spirit's leading in every part of our lives every part of our lives. Some translations say, let's stay in step with the Spirit. Go at the Spirit's pace and prompting. The pace of love. God's speed. We, we stop acting as though we're in control of our lives and we're in control of our time and we know best. But little by little, as we spend time in God's presence, listening to the Holy Spirit, we, we do hear his promptings and our desires line up with God's. And it's not drudgery, but it's joy. So we don't duck inside our house or our car to avoid a neighbor. And we may respond to a meal train when there's a need. Or we may take time to be kind to the server in the restaurant or actually thank a cashier for serving us or maybe say yes when it's easier to say no. All these ways we can be responsive to the Holy Spirit. But how does that happen? Well, we have to follow the Spirit's prompting into quiet time. There were many times where Jesus, led by the Spirit, chose solitude over people. He withdrew. He spent time with the Father. And this was key to his pace of love. Well, little known fact, I played the violin for 10 or 12 years. You will never see me play a violin here on stage. <laughs> it was like way in the past. But one thing that um, I had to do after I practiced or played my violin was before I put it away in a case, I had to um, loosen the tension on the bow, right? The, the, the hair on the bow is made of horse hair. 
and there's a little screw at the bottom of the bow that you could loosen, and that would take the tension off the, off the hair and off the, the wooden part of the bow. Because if you don't, um, that tension over time will weaken the hairs and they'll start to snap or it will make the bow warp and not useful anymore. One time, well, probably many times, I was just too lazy to always loosen the, the bow. And I opened up my filing case and like, ping, there were strings all over, hairs all over the place. I'm quickly snipping them off before my mom sees. But you know, a, a bow becomes ineffective it won't play music if it's not uh, dialed back, if the tension isn't taken off, if it's not put to rest, as we might say. And our lives are the same, right? We need to step back. We need to spend time with the Father. We need to loosen the tension, listen to his voice, or we'll become ineffective, of no use. We won't be able to play music in our lives. We want to be people who are in step with the Spirit, and the only way we will be able to do that is if our character is shaped by the Spirit, if we're attentive to the Spirit's voice, so that we can be interruptible people. As we close, I just want us to think about this. See, I'm reminded of the most extravagant, the greatest, the most amazing interruption of all time. We spoke of it at the beginning, but God interrupted history for us. The greatest interruption of all time was Jesus. His incarnation was an interruption where God came because of his great love for us and rescued us from our sin, from death, through the, the death and resurrection of his own son of Jesus. It's an astounding interruption, and it all because he loves us. Sometimes people wonder, does God have time for me? You know, is he too busy with all the big stuff in the world, like wars and, you know, really important things? And I don't, I don't know, should I bother him with what's going on in my life? When our passage today, there were a couple of people who felt that, right? The woman who was sick, she didn't want to be noticed. She felt like, oh, my, I can't bother Jesus. I'll just go up behind and you know, touch his garment. And the servant, actually, didn't want to bother Jesus too. He said, it's no use, it's hopeless, Jesus can't do anything now. Do we ever feel like that? That God can't be bothered, that our problems are too little, that he can't be interrupted, that we don't want to trouble him? Listen, we have an interruptible God. He came near in the person of Jesus. He's given us his spirit. And when we come to God, we aren't an interruption. He's always bending towards us. He always wants to walk with us, to listen and care and carry us. He gives us compassion and time and love. You're not an interruption. He welcomes you. We're his children. He invites us. Again, a reminder this morning, if you are here and you need to pray with someone, it's not an interruption. They're waiting. And God's waiting to, to hear your requests. Let's think about this as we go into the week, shall we? Can we pray together before the worship team leads us? God, our Father, thank you Thank you for interrupting our lives with the greatest love of all expressed in Jesus. Thank you for interrupting our lives to love us and care for us and listen to us. We want to live by the Spirit. We want to walk in step with the Spirit. We need help doing this. God, help us to walk at the pace of love in our families. Help us to walk at the pace of love in our school, in our workplace. Spirit, we give you permission to interrupt our lives. We want to see the divine moments, the God moments that you have for us this week. Help us to be attentive, take the blinders off, and 
Help us to walk in step with your spirit. We need your help in this, God. Thank you that you are not too busy for us. We are not an interruption. We are your beloved. Come meet us, we pray. In your name, amen.